Matthew 24, verse 15, for us to beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are predatory wolves. Welcome to the Worship Center in Bryan's Road, Maryland, where Jesus is saving lives, saving souls, and saving futures. Now here's Dr. Steve Davis with wisdom tips, life treats, and gold nuggets from God's Word. I want to continue on our study about false teachers and false prophets. We had part one last time. This is part two. As we're talking about a few more things that the scriptures warn about, you know, false teachers and false prophets. And you really don't hear much about it, even though the scriptures talk about it a lot. Jesus talks about it. It's Old Testament. It's New Testament because it's so common for people to come in and try to make merchandise of the people of God and to try to use the things of God for their own personal success and for their own personal promotion. And in Acts chapter 21, verse 29 to 31, the apostle Paul is talking here and he says, I know that after my departure, grievous wolves will come in to you, not sparing the flock. Okay, he says, wolves are going to come in amongst the believers, not sparing the flock, verse 30. And he says, and from you yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things in order to draw away disciples after them. So he's saying right here amongst these New Testament believers that he knew and he had discipled, he says, some of y'all are going to rise up and become that way. In verse 31, he said, watch therefore, remembering that three years, night and day, I did not stop warning each one of you with tears. So last time we looked at the first clue that a ministry is false, and that's in the area of the content of the message. Does it appeal to the spirit or does it appeal to the flesh? Romans 8 verse 13 says, For if you live after the flesh, you will die. But if through the spirit you do mortify or put away the desires, the lusts of the flesh, you shall live. You know, our earthly life is a continual conflict between the Holy Spirit drawing us upward and the flesh pulling us back down towards the earth, towards sin, towards failure, towards missing God. And our only hope of victory is by the power of the Holy Spirit and allowing him to fill us, to lead us, to guide us, to transform us by the renewing of our minds to the word of God, making us victorious, overcomers, and godly, spiritual in our lives. So now we're looking at lifestyle. There's a lifestyle of a man or woman of God compared to the lifestyle of the false teacher. You know, and one of the most, most obvious immediate red flags of the false teacher is their preoccupation with external things, with their clothes, their accessories, possessions, their outward appearances. Now, listen to Jesus describing the ministry of a true prophet, talking about John the Baptist. In Matthew 11, verses 7, 8, and 9, he says, and as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, or talking about John, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? What did you guys go out there for? To see a reed shaking with the wind, like a grass blowing? Well, what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft and fine clothes or expensive clothes? He goes, look, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out there to see? A prophet? Yes, he said, I say to you, and more than a prophet. So Jesus is saying that the true man or woman of God is not going to be preoccupied with which designer produced their clothes or looking like a religious mannequin displaying the latest whims of the fashion industry and trying to dress like some celebrity, some carnal celebrity. Their credibility is not in their clothes and accessories and how much they cost. You know, that's the thing is, it doesn't give credibility saying, you know, I'm a real man or woman of God with eternal values if at the same time I'm totally preoccupied with what's the latest piece of clothing that I can be wearing that's, you know, something that, uh, you know, I can be supporting, you know, four missionaries in a foreign country for that for, you know, two months for the cost of a t-shirt. And so many times it's like some of the teachers are almost like they're in a costume. You know, like they're modeling the latest styles, accessories, and looks that this world has to offer. And the false teacher dresses for popularity with those who are easily swayed by outward appearances. The clothing of the false teacher appeals to the flesh and to pride and to ego. And you and I both know it isn't the clothes that gives us credibility. It's being clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That, and that's our credibility. You know, it's not the man or woman of God. It's not that we have to dress like a walking yard sale or in sloppy, worn out, or out-of-date clothes. 
But the thing is, the clothes won't even be what you notice about a true man or woman of God. And I want to tell you that because sometimes people think God can't use them. You know, you might even think God can't use me. I don't have the budget. You know, I can't afford $1,500 shoes. You know, I can't afford jeans that cost $1,000. You know, I can't afford an $800 t-shirt or hoodie. And I want to encourage you, those aren't the things that give you credibility. In fact, if you've got the anointing of God on you, people aren't even paying attention to what you're wearing. You know, their attention won't be drawn to the clothes in either direction, either that you're dressed like some kind of celebrity model or you're dressed like, you know, a, say a walking yard sale. The attention needs to be directed to Jesus. And the true prophet and the true teacher just isn't caught up in the things of this world. And, you know, they, they almost seem out of touch in that realm. You know, they understand that the things of this world are more like tools for, for fulfilling the call of God on their life. Jesus said there in Matthew 11 and verse 9, that if you want to see a person clothed in this world's latest and best fashions, don't be expecting to see a true prophet. He said people dressed like that live in king's houses, implying that prophets don't either live in the king's houses. You know, and so many times now we've got someone that's that is absolutely competing with the rich and famous of this world. And Jesus said, yeah, but they're not a prophet, not according to Bible definitions. You know, Jesus said these folks went out to see a prophet. And the Bible is clear that John wasn't dressed. John the Baptist wasn't dressed like a politician or a pimp or an entertainer. Why? Because John the Baptist wasn't the servant of man. He's the servant of God. You know, and Jesus talked a lot about the lifestyle of the false prophet and the false teacher. He said in Matthew 24, verse 15, for us to beware of false prophets, uh-oh, talking same topic, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are predatory wolves, ravenous wolves. He said, yeah, they look nice enough. They dress nice. Yeah, they're friendly and they're likable, at least outwardly. They say the right words and have the right facial expressions. You know, they're right phrases. They're charming. Their teachings are pleasant. And they make you feel good. And Jesus said, yeah, these folks look okay on the outside. He goes, it's the inside where the problem is. On the inside, they're operating from a completely different motive than the true man or woman of God. He called them hungry wolves, greedy, unsatisfied, unsatisfiable, devouring, selfish, cruel, deceptive. All these describe the heart of the false prophet and teacher. A second thing to notice is the whole idea of man-pleasing, getting the crowd the mark of the high calling of popularity, that that seems to be the biggest goal. You know, when you see a true man or woman of God, you're not seeing somebody who's overly concerned about people's opinions. You know, the true man or woman of God is concerned only about one opinion, and that's the opinion of the Lord who called them, the Lord who gave them a mission, the Lord who gave them a work to do, the Lord who gave them an assignment. And Jesus talked about the false teacher saying that they're like a reed shaken with the wind, you know, or a blade of grass, tall grass blown with the direction of the wind. And this describes a preacher or teacher who is seeking constant validation, wanting to know what's trending in teaching and what's trending in preaching right now. What are people wanting to hear right now? What are they listening for? What are they looking up? What topics do they want me to, to avoid? You know, what are some things I better not talk about if I want to keep growing the crowd? Another place the Holy Spirit teaches us about the lifestyle of the true man or woman of God compared to the false one is in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, where Paul says, Now, do I persuade men or God? In other words, who's my audience? Is my audience God or is my audience man? He said, Do I seek to please the human audience? He said, If I still was trying to please people, he said, I wouldn't be the servant of Christ. He said, But I certify to you, brethren that the gospel which was preached by me is not after pleasing man. A third mark is more hype, more feel good than there is power. You know, where the true man or woman of God is concerned with helping you to serve the Lord, with discipling you and helping you overcome those things that are trying to overcome you, and they do it plainly, clearly, simply, so you can understand it. The false prophet is smooth, likable, non-offensive, non-confrontational, to the point that you might not even be sure what they're saying. But listen to how the Apostle Paul words it, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 4. He says, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. 
You know, it's a constant challenge. It's a constant battle to keep leaders and God's people from devising human substitutes in the absence of the blessing of the Holy Spirit in their lives. You know, and people come up with all kinds of gimmicks and tricks and no end to the foolishness in the name of Jesus to try to attract the crowds and build their popularity. I mean, some of them are like just putting on, you know, for a, a Sunday morning service, almost like a complete stage production. And so many times the churches are flooded with weak entertainment, dead programs, worldly sounding concerts, and, you know, light shows like from a 70s disco or something. All of them sad substitutes for the Holy Spirit in his presence. We don't need to do that. You know, we need to just shut ourselves in with the Holy Spirit and spend time with him. Paul says, who am I trying to please? That's the question. Our goal is to please the Lord and not to yield to the pressures of the carnal people who want their every whim and their every want catered to. Paul said, am I trying to please men? Am I trying to please humans? Am I a people pleaser? If I was still a people pleaser, I wouldn't be the servant of Christ. I can't serve two masters. The Holy Spirit in 1 Timothy 4, verse 2, 3, and 4 says, and this is the admonition, God's instruction to speakers, to preachers. He said, first of all, preach the word. He said, here's what I'm telling you what to preach. And you know, that really is a thing that bothers a lot of people is this whole idea of preaching the word. What am I supposed to be teaching you? What am I supposed to be preaching? My political opinions? No. Pop psychology? No. Preach the word, the Bible, the scriptures, the word of God. He said, this is what we're supposed to be preaching. This is all I'm authorized to preach by the Lord. He's what go forth in all the world and what preach the gospel. Here he says, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He said, because a time will come when people won't endure sound doctrine, but after their own desires, they're going to gather themselves groups of teachers having itching ears. They want, they're they going to turn their ears away from the truth and will be turned away instead unto fable stories. Fables, these stories and all. You know, we don't preach what's popular. You know, God never called men and women to go preach whatever would make them popular and give them favor with man. You know, God never said, find out what they like and preach it. Find out what they don't like and avoid it. And you know, the Bible tells you if you want favor with man, and that's not a bad thing, you have to have people respond to you. I get it. I want to be liked. You want to be liked. I don't think anybody wants to not be liked. We have to have people that will listen to us in order for us to fulfill our ministries. But guess what? Favor with man comes through obedience to God. That's what God raises you up. Luke 2 verse 52 talks about Jesus said that he grew in stature, statue in his size and in favor with God and man. And you know, God only calls and instructs his people to teach the word. And you know, there's pressure. I get pressure. People wanting me to preach political viewpoints and want me to preach this theory and that theory. Hey, why don't you preach a bit about this? Because God told me to preach the word and I'm not done preaching the word yet. Always the word of God. There's still a lot here to go through. And when I'm done all that and I've come back and you know, gone through it again and again a few more times, maybe in a few thousand years, there might be something else, you know, worth commenting on, but I can't think of what it would be. And you know, what you believe is important. And the Bible says that in the last days, people won't go for true preaching of the word of God. Their ears will be itching for nice, smooth messages. that wouldn't even offend the devil. In the last days, People won't even support a ministry or go to a church unless it will feed their vanity and their pride, unless it will boost their egos or unless it will confirm them in their politics. I mean, these last few years, you know, there's so many churches where people are leaving because the pastor isn't teaching the politics they want to hear. And there's other ones that are growing because the pastor's given in, the leadership has given in, say, let's give them the political stuff they want to hear to get them in here. You know, let's appeal to their prejudices or their racism. Let's appeal to their pride. And you know, in these last days, people actually need the plain, clear, simple truth of the Word of God because that's what delivers us from the distractions of this world and the temptations and the traps of the enemy. 
You know, God doesn't call a man or woman saying, go out there and tickle their ears, O man or woman of God. That's the way to get a crowd. You know, God never even commanded any church to get a big crowd. No, he tells us, he instructs us to preach his word. Let him give the increase. And he says always, whether it's in season, fashionable or not, then he explains what he means by preaching the word. He doesn't say, teach them how to get rich, teach them how to be popular. He doesn't say, teach them how to get involved in the politics of this fallen corrupt system. He does not say, teach them how to put their families in recreation and personal pleasure in the, before him and before the work of God. He says, reprove, which means to correct, to remind, to bring the truth to. He says rebuke, which means sometimes you got to confront people, challenge them, deal with whatever isn't right in their lives. And then he says to exhort, which means to teach, to warn, to instruct, to encourage, to stir up. That's preaching the gospel. And you know, the false teachers in the ministry for personal power, for popularity and financial gain, that's the goal, to take advantage of the people of God, to take their money and anything else they can get from them. Jesus said it in Matthew 24, verse 21. He said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That's what Jesus says. In fact, he goes on in Matthew 24, verse 22 there. He says, many will say to me in that day, listen to this, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? And in your name, haven't we cast out devils? And in your name done many wonderful works? He said, many will say this. It's not just a few that are going to say it. Jesus says it will be many in this condition, many that worked miracles and built great ministries in the name of Christianity or in the name of Jesus. And Jesus agrees that, yeah, you did have big ministries. You had an effective ministry, at least on the outside. You did all kinds of cool stuff in my name. He said, but the problem with these false teachers isn't so much that their whole doctrine was wrong or even that they weren't active in, in the area of ministry. He says the real problem with these people is this, Matthew 24, verse 23. He says, and then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. The problem is they weren't walking with Jesus. That was the first problem. It wasn't a personal relationship or devotional life they were ministering out of. It was more like a spiritual show or entertainment or to put it in the language of the false prophet. You know, well, I was just meeting the needs of the people. Lord, I had to come up with something. You know, that's what the false prophet would say. And Jesus said, yeah, but you worked iniquity. You weren't honest. You weren't what you represented yourself to be. When you're out there, up there on stage or on the platform or on TV, your ministry is just a character you're playing, you know, just pretending that you're some man or woman of God. But, you know, backstage in the hotel room, they were com somebody else completely. And that's what Jesus was saying when he was talking about these false teachers who did so much and had such popular ministries, even though they personally weren't living what they were preaching. Miracles happened. Good works happened. Devils were cast out. That was good. And it wasn't them that did it anyway. It was God. They were just in it for the gold and the glory and the pleasure that comes with it. And they presented themselves as being something other than they were. That's the iniquity. In equity, if you want to put it like that. Not equal. They weren't equal to what they were presenting themselves to being. And it's the lifestyle of the false teacher that will do him or her in. And it will come out. Maybe in the front pages of the tabloids, the tabloids, or maybe online or on TV, or maybe only on the last day when we all stand before the Lord. But we know that everything that's hidden shall be revealed. And our salvation isn't dependent on the claims and tricks and the devices of human wisdom. But our salvation is dependent on Jesus Christ himself, on his blood and his righteousness, received by faith as we come to him by grace. Thank God you and I can come straight to Jesus as we are, and we know that he won't leave us as we are. We come to him as we are, but he doesn't leave us as we are. Well, I'm definitely out of time, but I just wanted to get these truths to you. Remember to pray for me. I pray for you, and remember to like, share, and subscribe. God bless you. We hope you were blessed, inspired, and challenged by what you heard today. And we pray that God spoke some inspired truths into your heart. This ministry is supported by your gifts and donations. If you'd like to help us spread the good news, you can give at our website, www.theworshipcenter.org, 
or you can text to give at 301-637-0777. It's easy and takes only seconds to set up. Thank you for listening and God bless you and your family. <laughs>